So what in the world is intentional spontaneity? That's the topic today down at Dana Point Harbor from the sandbar. I hope you enjoy. So what's intentional spontaneity? What do I mean by that? Let me take you back in time to a case I had where we're about halfway through a 10 day jury trial. I'm representing a family whose son uh, was wrongfully killed as a result of a non-emergency ambulance transport between Hospital A and Hospital B. Because of his physical and emotional situation, and this is a public case, uh, he was, soft restraints were used to keep him inside the ambulance so that he couldn't escape and hurt himself. Well, what happened was the soft restraints were not properly applied to his wrist and ankles during the transport, and he was able to get out of the back of the ambulance and was hit by a truck and killed on the freeway. We were retained to represent the family on the wrongful death case, and when we took the deposition of the manager of the ambulance company in charge of teaching soft restraint application protocol to transport victims, how that's done. And during the deposition, what we discovered is that over a three year period of time before our client's son was able to untie himself and jump out of the back of the ambulance, they had, and, and don't hold me to this, I'm paraphrasing best memory, something like 15 to 20 other patients over the last three years do the same thing. None of them were seriously injured, none of them were certainly killed, but they were able to release themselves from the soft restraints. Our expert, who happened to be a fire captain in Orange County, California, never an expert before, first time he ever testified on the stand, testified that in 20 years of teaching firemen and paramedics how to apply soft restraints, he had never had anyone able to escape from the soft restraints. As a matter of fact, the purpose of the soft restraint is to keep someone from untying themselves and harming themselves. The other side's expert, when I had him on the stand, testified that, well, it happens every now and then, no big deal. As a matter of fact, the other side found him on the internet. He admitted to being paid $16,000, so he had 16,000 reasons to testify to what he testified in front of the jury. And he frankly didn't think the defendant ambulance company did anything wrong. Now here's the thing. Remember I took the manager's deposition and she testified that before my client's death, they had had 15 to 20 other releases over a three year period. In the middle of trial, in front of the jury, having her on the stand, I had that feeling. It was a spontaneous but intentional type of feeling that I needed to ask the next question. A lot of people will tell you, and you'll hear on TV, and probably a lot of you in law school, never ask a witness a question you don't know the answer to. Nine out of 10 times, that's probably a good safe rule to take. But if you want to, if you want to get a different result than everyone else, sometimes you have to take calculated risk based upon a foundation of years of experience and practice and evidence and reading people, people skills and things like this. And that's what was going down right now in court, in real time, in front of the judge and the jury. So once I asked her on the stand and she confirmed that they had had 15 to 20 people over the last three years prior to this young man's death, managed to untie themselves, and they had not made any changes to their protocol. They felt they were doing everything just right. Out of thousands of transports, what's 15 or 20, right? Well, one's too many, you already know that. But I asked the next question. I said, let me ask you a question. And I looked over at the jury, I looked up at the judge, I said, since the date of Mr. So-and-so's death, he was 21 at the time of his death, how many people since that date up through today, the day of trial, have released themselves from the soft restraints? And she paused and I reminded her that she was under oath and she answered, I believe she answered between eight and 12. Now it had taken us a couple of years of litigation to get to that point. So 
I took a step back and said, are you telling me that since the date of Mr. So-and-so's death, another eight to 12, it might've been 15, another eight to 12 people have managed to release themselves from the soft restraints and you haven't made any changes to your policy and procedures? And she said, that's, that's, that's the case. Well, needless to say, her testimony along with the testimony of other witnesses, the testimony of my, my clients, uh, mom and dad, who were great witnesses, managed to help us bring home a million dollar verdict for the clients. But it was that intentional spontaneity, that intentional gut feeling that I had to ask that question because I knew there was something else there. And I will tell you, if her answer had been zero, then I would have handled it a different way. It was a calculated risk. But let's take take a step back and talk about what in the world does this have to do? Sorry, I heard, thought I heard someone behind me. What in the world does this have to do with social media content, with creating personal branding content and answering people's questions? Here's the deal. Think about this for a second. What type of content keeps your interest? What type of content do you search out or find fascinating, entertaining, engaging, memorable, and unique when you're on social media? Whether it's a website, whether it's a, a blog post, a podcast, it's something that happens that you're not expecting. It's something that's not scripted. It's real world, real time. It's not necessarily gotcha moments, but it's something that's just different. And what I've noticed is when you, instead of scripting out or using a teleprompter, for example, if you're doing video, oh, there's some birds coming down the pier. I'm gonna turn this around if they make it all the way down to us. What I want you to do is rely upon what you already know. Rely upon your understanding of the facts. Trial lawyers out there, you know your opening statement and your closing argument. You don't need to read that to a jury. Rely upon all of your years of experience and put together based upon your reading of the jury, body language, facial expressions, right? Questions they've asked you during jury selection, put together a presentation that is in the moment, that is playing off of exactly what they wanna hear right now, not something you wrote last week, last month, or a year ago. Social media content, I think, works the same way. If you give yourself permission to trust yourself, and rely upon, if you're talking about a breaking news story, if you're talking about a new client's case, hop on social and understand that you've got years and years of experience of talking to people. Talking to a camera is just like talking to someone sitting across your desk, whether it's a judge or 12 people in the jury box. And allow yourself to be yourself and make mistakes, but speak from the heart and share your ideas. You're being spontaneous because it's not scripted you're jumping on and commenting about something and you're doing so in an intentional fashion, but it's also the type of content that people enjoy watching. It's also the type of content that will separate you from everyone else. Here's the thing. When I asked that question, I was ready for any answer. You know, at that point, probably tried about 65 jury trials in Orange County. I'm talking about real trials, like one or two weeks long, not hearings. I think the average in California is three trials during a trial lawyer's career. And, uh, hang on just a second. Even when I'm out on the water, the phone's ringing. I'm gonna ignore it, I don't know if you can hear it. Um, you know, just years of experience when it comes to dealing with procedure, the evidence code, and everything else in between. And so, I was ready for whatever answer this witness gave from the stand. There was a foundation there. I wasn't just winging it, I was just relying upon my life experiences, both as a human being and as a trial lawyer. And regardless of her answer, I was gonna maximize that to my client's benefit. You can do the same thing, regardless of the business that you're involved with, regardless of what you do for a living, regardless of the topic, think about how can you be more spontaneous in what you're doing. I'm doing it right now out on the harbor. This was not planned but I needed to get out, it's Monday morning, and I thought, you know what, I'll just shoot a video from the harbor, but I'm, I'm relying upon years of sailboarding and paddleboarding, years of using video, uh, sharing years of trial lawyer experience with you, right? Right now, and you can do the same thing. Let's say you're new, let's say you just, 
you just rolled out your company, you're a young entrepreneur, you don't have years of experience, you don't have that gut feeling, you, you haven't developed that sixth sense yet. How do, you, how do you allow yourself to be intentionally spontaneous? Here's what you do. Study other people. Study successful people who have been there and done that. Read books, watch videos, watch TED Talks. In other words, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Tap into their knowledge, find out what they're doing, and start modeling and patterning, uh, developing a pattern on how you deal with issues, on how you build out your business around other people that have already done that. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a new lawyer pick a jury or give an opening statement, and I, I'm thinking to myself, just give me 30 minutes of your time. 30 minutes of your time, and I could, I could save you 15 years of mistakes. So for the new business owners, the new entrepreneurs out there, study what other people are doing. What's their procedure? What's their pattern? What are the steps they take to go from A to B, and then B to C, and C to D? That's what I recommend you do. And then once you figure out those steps, and it's not that complicated, the secret, what I've noticed to success, is, in, is taking action. The information's out there. Most people don't take the step, don't, don't take the next step of digesting and learning the information and then taking action. So what I want you to do is study what other people are doing and then give yourself permission to step into their shoes just as though you had been doing what they've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years and be intentionally spontaneous. I'm telling you guys, if you guys do this when you're closing a deal, trying a case, creating content on social media, you're going to have such a, a much greater impact on your audience, on the results that you're getting, and how other people perceive who you are and what you do. And when that's your clients and your customers, that's huge. So that's my takeaway for this morning. Once again, down at Dana Point Harbor, just a gorgeous day. I'm going to go around the island. Maybe I'll share a couple of more pictures or videos. But between now and next time, you guys connect with me over at streaming.lawyer. Join me on my Wednesday night uh, legal marketing show. This Wednesday night, I've got my daughter, AJ Jackson, as my special guest. She's a first year lawyer up at Shepherd Mullen. And she's going to be talking to us about millennials in the law, millennials in business, and what we need to know about them. All right, you guys, take care, enjoy the rest of your day, and make it a masterpiece. Bye-bye.